thanks for coming back for another video. In this video, we are going to talk about 10 myths surrounding foster care and the real truths behind those myths. So I hope you guys enjoy. Thanks for watching. Myth number one is that you have to be a stay-at-home parent, you have to be married, you have to be wealthy, you have to own your own home, and none of this is true. When we first became licensed foster parents, both my husband and myself worked and some things just transpired with my working situation. And instead of finding a new job, we just decided that it would benefit our family at that time for me to become a stay at home parent. And it's a decision I am very glad we made because had we not made that decision at that time, our kiddo who we adopted would have never been placed in our home because he had a lot of medical needs when he was a newborn and we never would have been able to have the time to care for him. So at the time that was the right decision for us. That doesn't mean that I'm always going to be a stay at home parent. There might come a time when I decide to go back to the workforce. That does not, make, that does not mean that we have to stop being foster parents because we both are working. As far as being married, I know a lot of people who are single foster parents. You don't have to be married. You just have to be over the age of 21 and you have to meet the other recommendations or requirements to become a foster parent. As far as being wealthy, we are not wealthy people. We live in a very small home. Um, Wealth has nothing to do with it. You just need to show that you can provide for your family without relying on government programs. That's basically it. As far as owning your own home, there are a lot of people who are foster parents who rent and they are still perfectly capable and good foster parents. Myth number two is that all children who come into foster care have trauma that cannot be fixed. And that's not true. It is true that all children who come into foster care have trauma. Even if they come into foster care as an infant, a baby who was born perfectly healthy, they still are experiencing the trauma of being separated from their birth mother. And so all children who come into foster care have trauma of some sort. There are so many tools out there to help you and to help the children and for to help you to help the children to address all of these traumas, to work through all of these traumas. And it's not true that they all can't be fixed and they're all broken and can't be great citizens and great children. The third myth regarding foster care is that you have to provide everything, including insurance, and you get very little help for caring for foster children. And that's not the case. As far as insurance goes, all of the kiddos in our state, and I think nationwide, they qualify for Medicaid. So their insurance is completely paid for by state Medicaid. Now you can't use that out of state. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that works. We did have one of our kiddos who needed to go to the emergency room when we were out of state on vacation. And I am unsure. I just gave the bill that came in the mail to our social worker. And I'm unsure if the department paid for that or if they contacted the insurance and was like, look, this is what happened. Medical care was needed. And then the insurance paid for it. But again, I'm not 100% sure how that happened or how that worked out. As far as prescriptions go, those are all covered under the Medicaid as well. There are no copays. Um, we don't pay a dime. There have been instances in the past where we've had kiddos come who were neglected and they needed prescriptions right away before any of that Medicaid information could be processed. And in that situation, we did have to pay out of pocket for those prescriptions. However, when the Medicaid number came through and we got the Medicaid card, which it usually takes less than a week for us to get Medicaid cards. But when we did get that information, we took that uh, card to our pharmacy and our pharmacy then gave us all of the money back that we had initially spent for the prescriptions. So we did have to pay upfront that one time, but that hasn't happened again. Um, and we've not had any problems as far as doctor visits go. When we've taken kiddos in, um, it's just our responsibility to make sure we give them that Medicaid information as soon as it comes because all of their visits are backdated to when they were removed from the home. So even though the Medicaid card isn't here, they can still go to the doctor. You just have to make sure as soon as you get that Medicaid card that you take that information in to the doctor's office so that they can then bill the insurance for the visit that you had to have. I'm not saying that's how that works at every doctor's office or in every area or if that ha works nationwide. That's just what 
it works here. That's what my experience has been. As far as providing food for the kiddos, yes, it is our responsibility to provide food for the kiddos. However, all kids under the age of five qualify for WIC, which means that our infants qualify for formula. Uh, our department here, if for whatever reason you have a kiddo who cannot have the WIC provided formula, so we had a kiddo who needed special formula, we've had um, a kiddo which the WIC formula just did not agree with them, our department does reimburse us for the formula that we purchase. So we're still not paying out of pocket for the formula. Uh, and then for the older kiddos, WIC does give you help towards getting certain foods and things like that because they qualify for that. There have been occasions that we haven't used WIC for kiddos, but for the most part, we do get those services. Um, in the beginning, it I just really didn't like using those services, but now I understand that it's important for us to set up those services because when these kiddos are reunited, it just makes reunification a little bit easier for the parents because everything is already set up. All they need to do is go in and have that initial appointment then and have everything switched into their name. But because everything is all set up, it takes a lot less time for them to get everything switched into their name. And a lot of times the parents, when they get their kiddos back, they need that additional help. As far as clothing goes for the kiddos, we um, have some stockpile that we've saved from some of our kiddos. I save about a week's worth of clothes or my favorite things that we have. Other than that, all of the clothes that goes with the kiddos when they leave, if they grow out of something, uh, we do sell them and use that money to purchase new clothing for them. Or if they're really worn, we donate them or toss them or whatever the, the situation is regarding the condition of the clothing. Our county and area does provide $200 of a stipend that is given to you that can be used once in the child's um, foster care placement. So when we got our current placement, I could spend, I could submit receipts up to $200 for each of the kiddos. It does not need to be used all at once. Um, I have split it up. I used a portion of it when they initially came. Uh, and then I saved a portion of it because I knew that they would be here through the summer and then they would need fall and winter clothing. So I did save a portion of their stipend to then um, help towards purchasing the fall and winter clothing. Also, uh, foster parents do get a monthly stipend to help care for the kiddos. So that stipend is to compensate us for the groceries that we have to buy, the clothing that we have to buy, the supplies that they need um, when they're little. It helps pay for diapers and all of that kind of stuff. Um, all of the money that we get pretty much goes right back into the kids. There's usually not much left over <laughs> at the end of the month um, from what they have. So we, although there are, um, out of pocket expenses that we do have. Uh, if you're a thrifty shopper, if you're, um, a good budgeter, I think that your monthly expenses will probably be more upfront in the initial first month that they are placed with you. But after that, like I said, we stick to a pretty strict budget and we don't really go much over, um, our budgetary needs with the extra income we get from our current placement. So I think if you're good with your money and everything like that, you won't really be spending a lot of money out of pocket. Um, a lot of what you have will be reimbursed. Some areas, if kiddos are in special um, sports and stuff like that, there are some areas where the department will reimburse you for those things. Um, driver's education for teenagers, a lot of times those things can be reimbursed. So you just need to talk to your coordinator or your agency and find out what things that you're paying for for your kiddos are reimbursed, what things are things that are counted in the monthly stipend that you get, and then just go from there and decide what you're going to do as far as expenses and things like that. Myth number four is that Foster children have to have their own rooms, and that's not the case. We have foster children sharing rooms with our adopted kiddo, and it works out just fine, and there's no problems. Basically, children who are the same sex can share rooms. However, you probably wouldn't want a teenager sharing a room with a toddler. 
just a suggestion there. Um, I'm not sure if there are specific rules about what the age differences age differences are. However, um, I probably wouldn't do that. Um, in our area, children under the age of six can share a room if they are the opposite gender. Um, and then there are rules on like bunk beds. They have to be over a certain age. Um, I think they have to be over the age of six to sleep on the top of a bunk bed or anything like that. But children who are coming into your home through foster care do not need to have their own rooms. Now, sometimes you do have children who do need to have their own rooms for safety concerns. And those are things that the workers would address with you, hopefully prior to the initial placement. Myth number five is that you have no control over the children who come into your home. And that's not the case. They don't just call you and say, here's a child, take them. Basically, when you get licensed, you fill out some paperwork and it talks all about things that you're willing to work with with kiddos, things that you don't want to um, deal with with kiddos. There's different behaviors, uh, medical diagnoses. You can say no to any child who has diagnosed ADHD, autism. Um, you can say no to any children who have been victims of sexual violence or anything like that. So you fill out this paper um, that says all of these different things that you're willing to work with or deal with in children. Um, and then you also can say uh, what age range you prefer. Uh, for us, we've chosen to take children under the age of our oldest, who is my stepson, who is nine, only because he's the oldest in our family and we don't feel like it's appropriate to take that birth right away from him. For some families, uh, birth order doesn't affect them. They take in kiddos who are older, who are younger. It's just all on everyone's preference and what they want to work with. We just felt like at this time, we're not really in the point in our life where we're ready to parent teenagers. So we are not taking teenagers right now. However, at some point when our kids get older, that's probably more along the lines of where we will end up. I don't imagine that I'm going to want to parent babies and toddlers for my whole entire life. Uh, they are exhausting after times and so I think when our kids get older and as our kids get older we will probably then start taking in children who are older but we do prefer to uh, respect the birth right or the birth order of our oldest and we will not take any kids who are older than him right now but you do have um, a lot of specifications that you can speci specify over who and what you're willing to work with and then they kind of compile that list and as kiddos come in they just kind of go over everything and think like oh this child would be um, a good fit for this family or a good fit for that family. Myth number six is that foster parents are in in it for the money and I kind of touched on this in a previous myth um foster parents aren't really in it for the money the money that we get from our foster kiddos pretty much is spent on them in a whole entire month for us at the end of the month there's really not a whole lot of leftover so the money that we're getting from them has pretty much all gone to provide their food their clothing um and and to pay for any special classes that they may be taking or sports or anything like that Myth number seven is that children in foster care do not have families that care about them. And I touched on this in the video I made prior to this about 11 things that foster parents want you to know. And that is simply not the case. Children who come into foster care have parents and extended families who absolutely love and adore them. Um, a lot of times extended families are not in the position where they can care for um, these children and a lot of times parents are kind of just stuck in the ways um, of life that they've been living and they don't know how to get out of it and they need help and they just need um, their kiddos to have a safe place to be so that they can get the help that they need so that their family can be all back together. So um, the theory that their parents must not love them is absolutely false. Um, their parents love them more than anything and they want what's best for them. They just need help to give them that. Myth number eight is that children in foster care are bounced from home to home. 
while there are some instances where foster children end up in more than one foster home, that's not always the case. For us, every foster child who has been in our home has come directly from family or from the hospital, and they have either been reunited with family or we have adopted them. Our current situation and our current foster kiddos, I believe they are on the track to possibly be reunited with some extended family in the future. Um, and while it's unfortunate that sometimes kids do bounce from home to home, that's not always the case. Uh, I know a lot of people and a lot of parents worry about those kinds of things, um, but when you have a good foster family in a good home, um, the kids usually don't go anywhere. I know a lot more people who have had foster kiddos for years at a time um, just because that's how long they've needed to stay there. And I know of just a very few foster kiddos who have been removed from the home uh, that they were in and put in a different foster home. And sometimes that has to do because um, they have a lot of big behaviors that um, that foster home isn't qualified to deal with. Or sometimes um, tragic things happen in foster families and they just can't continue caring for foster children. Um, foster parents go through their own life struggles and there are times when they're in the trenches of foster care and things happen and they just need to say like we need to um, put fostering on the back burner we can't give these kids what they need um, we need to take care of our own needs and our own things um, and so then those kiddos unfortunately have to go to a different foster home but in a lot of cases, children stay in one foster home. Um, it's not as common. I don't hear around here a lot about kids bouncing from home to home. There are foster homes that are foster only homes. And so when children get to the point of adoption, those children then are moved to different homes who are adoptive resources. And then the plan is once those kiddos move from that home, into the new home that that new home is their adoptive resource and so if those kiddos can't go back home then the home that they are in is the home that is going to adopt them a lot of times um, our department tries to find adoptive resources even though adoption is not the point of foster care um, they sometimes put kiddos in especially younger kiddos in adoptive resources right away or kiddos who have been in and out of um, the system in in and out of the system meaning they've gone back and forth between bio parents and foster homes on many occasions because it's just not working in their bio home um, sometimes they also try to put those kiddos in adoptive resources so that when the time comes and if the time comes that adoption is the right choice they're already in a home that um, would be open to adoption um, in our area the the workers try really hard to put kiddos in one home that they know um, is going to be able to manage any behaviors that they have so that they can avoid bouncing them um, from home to home. And our coordinators have a pretty good sense of the people that they work with and what kinds of things that they can deal with and manage and all of that kind of stuff. Myth number nine is that babies are the easiest to foster and that is not the case at all. While they're sweet and cuddly and everything, a good majority of babies that come into care came into care because they were born exposed to drugs. And those babies who were exposed to drugs are still going through withdrawals when they're released from the hospital. And so they cry a lot. Um, yeah, babies who are exposed are very hard to care for. It is not easy. Um, you get a lot of sleepless nights when you have babies um, who were exposed. And like I said, that's a great deal um, of the babies who do come into care. They were exposed to drugs in utero. They've gone through withdrawals. Um, they've had extended stays in the hospital because they've gone through withdrawals. A lot of times those babies struggle meeting developmental needs um, because of the drug exposure. And so then it becomes um, where they need to go to a lot of different therapies to help um, catch back up to where they should be. And um, it's just a lot. Um, it goes on and on. And then as they age even older than that, they have other um, things that are affecting them because of the drug exposure. And um, there's just a lot of 
uh, disorders and behaviors linked to kiddos who have been exposed in utero. So I don't think that caring for the newborns is necessarily the easiest. Um, we've gotten kiddos, we've had babies in our home who were not drug exposed. We've also had babies who were drug exposed. Um, we've had babies who were neglected and they are not necessarily the easiest to care for. Uh, we had one kiddo who came when he was nine months old and unfortunately I think he was left alone a lot and he wanted very little social interaction from us. We wanted to snuggle him and cuddle him and everything and when he first came he was very resistant to all of that. He wanted to just be put down on the floor and left alone and so your idea of what uh, caring for a baby is like probably stems from perfectly healthy babies who live with bio families, and a lot of times that's not the case. Sometimes it's easier to take kiddos who are older who can vocalize feelings that they're going through, um, and you can help them work through those feelings, and um, it's just a whole lot easier uh, when they can actually tell you what's going on. And finally, myth number 10 is that DCF workers or social workers have all the control over the situation and they make all of the decisions. And that's not how it works. In most instances, it is the judge who has the final say in everything. DCF or social workers can feel it's necessary to remove children from the home and they do so. And you can get to that initial court hearing, which has to happen within 48 hours of removal. And the judge can say, nope, there's not enough substantiated evidence. The children can go back home. There are times when kiddos have been in care for a long time and the social workers feel that maybe going home is not the best option for them right now. But the judge can say, well, they did X, Y, and Z so they can take the kids home. It really is not up to the social workers or DCF to determine when kiddos can leave, when kiddos can go back. Um, a lot of it is up to the judge. Now, if uh, in our area, you do not have to go to court for the kiddos to be returned. If parents are working their case plan and everything is going well and they're meeting all of those goals on their case plan, then they, the kiddos are gonna be returned. Um, there would have to be safety, like um, a huge safety concern. Uh, and then the social workers would have to go to court and say like, okay, they've done all of these things, but these are what our concerns are. And then ultimately it's up to the judge whether they can go back or not. Thanks for watching this video about 10 myths around foster care. I hope you learned something new and that I set the record straight on a lot of things that um, people commonly think about foster care. Like always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to comment them below. If you have any other topics you would like me to address or other things you'd like to see, also comment those below. Otherwise, have a great day and thanks for watching.